Welcome to the Hollywood and Toto Podcast. Entertainment news and reviews without the woke Hollywood narrative. Free speech, free expression. Now that's entertainment. And here's your host, award-winning film critic, Christian Toto. This week on the Hollywood in Toto podcast, we hear from the Office alum, Rain Wilson, about Hollywood's unspoken bigotry against one group in particular. You might think you know the answer, but you're probably wrong. We talk with a TV executive turned YouTube star, Paul Chatto, about online fame, Hollywood, and why the woke revolution is absolutely crushing creativity in La La Land. And we wrap with a tribute to an R-rated comedy that deserves a new look, and not just for its fetching star. Hollywood actively discriminates against this one rather large group, and it's been doing just that for years. Now, if you screamed out, conservatives, you're not wrong, of course, but the industry also squirms over another group, something a sitcom alum explored in a recent podcast interview. We're talking about Rain Wilson of The Office fame. It's such a great show. And he's on the promotional circuit for a new book. I'll share more about the book in a minute. I don't want to spoil things here. But listen to Rain open up on the No Small Endeavor podcast. He's talking about belonging to a specific group and why it's done him few favors in Hollywood. I've been talking about it in bite-sized pieces for a good 12 years. And frankly, I think it freaks people out. Hmm. I think that most of Hollywood, especially comedians in Hollywood, talking about is the uncoolest thing you can ever possibly do. Now, comedians will <laughs> call themselves nerds and say, oh, I'm so uncool, I'm so uncool. But it's this weird thing. It's like Hollywood is about who's sitting at the cool kid's lunch table, huh. just like in high school. And are you invited to sit at the cool kid's lunch table or not? And I've had some success on The Office, and Saturday Night Live, and some movies that I've done, and a few little things here and there. But I've never been invited to sit at the cool kids' lunch table because I think people are like, that's so weird, that comedy guy, that big, weird-looking Rain Dwight guy just talking to Oprah about <laughs> how bizarre. We bleeped that part of that conversation. Uh, I still think you can guess what he's talking about, right? It's God. Wilson believes in God. He's not a Christian now. He's a member of the Baha'i faith, which, according to CBS News, is one of the fastest-growing religions in the world. Who knew? And he's also savvy enough to realize that believing in God isn't in your best interest when you're working in La La Land. Now, just swap out believer or Christian for any other group, Muslims, Asians, LGBTQ people, and Wilson's story takes on a whole new dimension, a darker dimension. There would be outcries across the industry just based on his anecdotes. But he can share his personal story knowing nothing's going to change in Hollywood and there's no outcry about to happen. Not a chance. You know, he's lucky to have made his fortune, which he talks about, and he has enough money right now so he can do whatever he wants, including writing a book like Soul Boom. In that book, he calls for a spiritual uprising. I can't say he's wrong, and he's certainly addressing our troubled times. So while Hollywood demands more diversity, more ways to make the Oscars help out marginalized groups, the industry simultaneously casts a stink eye against those who have a strong faith core. It's showbiz, folks, and man, it can be ugly. <laughs> You know, some YouTube stars make it look easy. They crank out video after video. They tweak the algorithms as they wish. And of course, they slap all those funny thumbnails on each clip to make them go viral. Well, Paul Chatto goes above and beyond those techniques. Now, not knocking his thumbnails. They're actually pretty good. First rate, really. But so is the content. Why? Well, he's a comedian for starters. That certainly helps. He's a funny guy injecting all of his videos with humor and heart and insight. Yes, he was a TV executive calling the shots on what clicks and what doesn't on the boob tube. Yeah, I know that phrase is past its prime, but it still makes me giggle. Paul opens up about his YouTube fame, sharing some secrets behind his viral success. But he also explores how his first attempts at YouTube didn't go quite as planned. 
I think if you look at Mr. Beast's past, you understand that, hey, there's no overnight success in YouTube land. That's for sure. Because Paul is a smart fellow. And I think if you're hearing my chat with him, you'll know what I mean. Paul, thank you for joining the show. You know, it's one thing to post videos on YouTube. It's another to draw a crowd, get thousands of subscribers. You've done that. Is there a secret sauce to that approach? And was there a moment where you realized, hey, I'm not just speaking into the ether. (laughs) People are really enjoying what I'm saying. Well, the secret sauce only happens when you've actually kissed the girl and she says yes. (laughs) But up until that point, you don't know what's going on. Gotcha. And the fact that you're a funny person, you've been a comedian for years, I imagine that's part of the part of the appeal here where you're in, not just ranting, you're not just critiquing, but you're making people laugh along the way. Well, that's always been my goal. And my initial uh, stab at YouTube was to do a kind of a semi-humorous uh, tech channel. But the tech uh, community. Not that I didn't build a good community. Uh, I, I had 20,000 subscribers and some of my videos hit 200,000 views, but they like sophomoric, not thoughtful humor. They mm-hmm. really didn't grok onto my Tim uh, Tim Cook uh, phone call parodies and <laughs> <laughs> my my parodies with uh, Bill Gates and stuff like that. It was like, what what are you doing making fun of Bill Gates? I don't get the gag. <laughs> and and even though I would write them, uh, uh, I, you know, very, uh, I, I would spend a lot of time writing them and trying to pack as many inside jokes because I've worked with Microsoft, uh, for Microsoft. I've worked for Apple Canada and, and uh, I've, you know, Letraset and I've been developing software. I know the business and even developed a game. I, I knew the lingo, but that really wasn't, particularly of interest, I guess, to the to the tech channel mm-hmm. uh, folk. And and then also uh, YouTube tech just imploded with the price of products and people weren't building stuff anymore. They couldn't afford to build stuff anymore and just got boring. I mean, really. And, uh, you know, that was fun for a while, uh, but that got boring. And, and so, but even within that context, I was trying out different formats. Mm-hmm. Uh, humor-based formats. I even did something called science and tech stand-up where I re- literally held a microphone to my, you know, to, to my mouth and, and wrote uh, stand-up material around uh, uh, physics, you know, and, and the latest symposiums that I would read about, you know, the, what they had done there and what they were discovering and what they were talking about. And, and I was doing quantum mechanics gags. <laughs> That which which killed, by the way. Funny. <laughs> but it that didn't that went nowhere. Yeah. And actually people disliked it immensely. Oh my gosh. And the one thing that's good about YouTube is how quickly you get feedback for the stuff that you do. And you don't take it personally. Mm. You try something. I mean, the the problem that people have is that they don't try enough things and they don't kill it quickly enough it's if it's not working yeah and i mean that is you know, as, as a network former network executive uh that's one of the things that you were always looking for were the rating sheets every single morning what were the, what we called them the overnights mm-hmm. and you you poured over those as as if they were jesus's sermons from the mount and so, then so how um, do you do that with the flood of youtube comments because everyone comments most of the comments can be troll-like or silly or, or poorly organized. But it's your job as a creator to filter through that and find out the, the gold in a, in a sense. What's working? What criticisms are, met, are, are worthwhile? How do, you, how do you sift through all that to get to the good stuff? So I've tried to create an atmosphere where my subscribers add to the gag mm-hmm. and not just pontificate. Not that you can't stop it, but the best posts are people who think of bits that I didn't think of and just make the entire experience of reading the comments Mm -hmm. part of the the theater uh, that I've tried to create. Those are the best. Now, obviously, you can't stop people, you know, saying, uh, oh, I think you're wrong about Marvel Iron Man. He's actually got three colored suit, not a four colored <laughs> suit. And it's not really red. It's a burnt amber. And, <laughs> you know, it's a number 53, uh, uh, you know, 
uh, Pantone colors. So like, you're completely wrong. I mean, I'm not talking to those people. Sure. Um, and there, I mean, there will always be those people and bless their hearts. Uh, they, they love their, they love their properties. Uh, and their color palettes, you know, the one of the things that you realize fairly early on in the YouTubing realm is that what you produce is just an excuse to generate com comments. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes, there's an entertainment value and maybe a uh, informational value that I might provide. But for the most part, once it's been released, then it's all up to the people who want to comment because they are entertaining themselves. Yeah. It's so interesting that you invite them into the process too, which I think is a very 21st century approach, which is obviously successful given the, given the health of your channel. Now, I'm going to ask you a question that's wildly unfair and, and too big for any one show, but I still want to get your opinion because I know you're so smart sure. and you've got, you've got an interesting background. I mean, you know, marketing and TV executive and comedy. Someone from Team Disney calls you up. And you know they're they're in trouble. The brand is is struggling. The box office flops are multiplying. What do you say to them? Where, where do you even start to kind of right the ship? It's in, besides you know putting on six pots of coffee and and you know knowing it's well, going to be a long night. I, I think it's important uh, if Disney called me that they find a figurehead who is capable of talking to the audience. Honestly, uh, when something is bad, they admit it. Mm -hmm. we're, we're dealing with a new zeitgeist where uh, you need to be uh, honest with the audience because you can't fool them. Yeah. You can't shove product down their throat that is obviously inferior. And it's like selling on the internet. I, I sell websites. I mean, my main business is selling, um, um, you know, we build websites, uh, but you can't do it the old way. You're, you're not going to fool anybody. Uh, and, and this is the problem with the big players is that they still think they can manipulate the audience by putting out bullshit uh, trailers mm. and 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 uh, actors crying in their cars on on just how bad the fans are <laughs> and and so what what we're not getting is a figurehead who can chill out with the uh, with the online community mm -hmm independent of whatever complaints i might have in terms of disney going for the politics of social justice over just giving the fans a bone which they they just don't want to do for whatever reason that's a completely different discussion yeah yeah but yeah i i would i, I would advise them in many many different ways of, of how they're doing it wrong if their goal is to make money i i can show them how to make money but they won't listen to me yeah you know i often watch shows like your channel and then I watch other YouTube commentators, and I thought, so many interesting critiques here, thoughtful, nuanced, smart. And I think, gosh, wouldn't it be great if some Hollywood executives were watching this, taking notes, even disagreeing at times for sure? Do you get any sense that that those people are checking out your shows or reaching out to you, maybe even privately? Is, is there any connection there between your voice and and the creators because i would think that would be an invaluable connection uh not the creators with an agenda mm -hmm. i mean i'm sure that the terry metallicis of the world who who is quite um he's around he's 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 on twitter he makes himself available so that is the kind of person i'm talking about mm -hmm. you know, james gunn makes himself available on twitter he's visible uh, everybody else, Kevin Feige, all these other apparent geniuses at Disney, they're gone. Yeah, it's just, it's just not going to work in a modern, modern world. Uh, now, you don't want the advice of the fan base. Uh, that's that's deadly. Mm -hmm. uh, but you do need to pull their feelings, so their feelings are always right, but their suggestions are pretty much always wrong. Interesting. And that's why as a creative person, you've got to interpret that the right way. But right now, Disney has got an agenda and you're just not going to be able to fight that. Yeah. I mean, uh, if they want to make money, they got to abandon the agenda. <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of the work that you do is critical of Hollywood. We're talking about it right now, what Disney's up to. And it's richly deserved. But 
Are there things that Hollywood is doing right now that are on target? Uh, maybe some pop culture trends you think that are helpful or provocative or on the money, either shows or networks or platforms or executives, anyone, any kind of creator or creative platform where, yeah, that I can, that's, that's something we can, we can latch onto. That's promising. They, they get it. Well, that's an interesting question. And uh, uh, part of this might be COVID, but uh, uh, now that being said, there's a great series on Amazon called Primo which is absolutely fantastic. And I suggest everybody go see that sitcom. Uh, I, there's just so many things have changed and it's hard to put a person's finger on it. I think streaming has been a disaster for the creative community in the long run. I think the volume of product that needs, that is required to fill the channels is a disaster. Uh, I, I don't know how you cope with that. I see very little really good writing. I see mostly bad writing. Um, the first episode of Strange New Worlds was just atrocious. And I feel badly for it. Um, I, I can see how it can be solved. I don't think they're interested in listening to me. <laughs> I, I think they're all geniuses. Or they think they're all geniuses. And... Uh, I, the, the the main thing for me is my time is done. I had my success and I would just love to see new IPs come out. And this is one of the things that's the challenge is that the people with an agenda can only usurp previous IPs. They have not come out with a single Harry Potter and Harry Potter is maybe the last giant IP. They like, what have they come out with? Nothing. Zero. Yeah, that's a great point. If, if they've not come up with the Star Wars and things like that, primarily because, I mean, uh, J.K. Rowling accepted, it's it's all been straight white dudes, which they hate. <laughs> so they hate us with a passion, but they don't know how to do it themselves. And they don't understand nerd culture. Uh, and, and not necessarily that's, not that nerd culture is the savior, but, uh, you know, they even take things like uh, Wheels of Time Wheel of Time, and then wreck it. So they they have some really good IP out there, but they don't know what to do with it. So that's a double-edged sword in that I'd really like to see some new young artists, especially in the comedy area, which is my main uh, interest, is that where's the next Will Ferrell? Uh, where's the next Ben Stiller? Not, not that neither of them aren't making stuff. They're just not doing it at the volume they used to when they were virile. Yeah, the once upon a time Saturday Night Live was the pipeline, and then every few Correct. years another another alum would come out and just kill it on screen, and then they he or oh, she would be a movie yeah. star, and that hasn't and, happened. And but where's the Woody? Where's the next Woody Allen? Not not the fifty year old guy that marries his adopted twenty one <laughs> daughter. I don't mean that Woody. Allen, not that one. But but the not, funny I guy. don't have any. <laughs> but you know, again, I I have to joke. So where is the Woody? I mean, mm. Woody Allen was a religion for us. We would just go. It was a Woody Allen movie. Yeah, it's you know, everything brand. you wanted, want, always wanted to know about sex. I mean, bang, we were there. Like, where, where is the comedian that you're going to go out and and you know watch their movie just based on, um, you know, their their name recognition and their brand? I'm. We just. But I, I don't even know if Hollywood knows what to do with these people. We have moments of of uh, sanity, like Megan. And and you go wow okay that that was that was really good. Mm -hmm. um, well, I want to get back to comedians because that that's your uh, area of expertise. Yeah. We just saw Bert Kreischer and Sebastian Maniscalco, two very funny people, bomb in theaters with solo projects that would seem perfectly, uh, you know, able to capture their audience, expand it. Why do you think that happened? And why why are, are we weaned off of comedy and movies? Is it because there haven't been that many in recent years? What's what do you think is going on there? I I think part of the problem is that uh, Hollywood has basically forgotten how to do middle movies. Mm. It's either really cheap or the blockbusters. And they're not interested in like The Graduate or, you know, they, Hollywood was about hitting singles and doubles, not, not swinging for the fences. Uh, and even like Easy Rider, which was an accidental home run 
they didn't make it as a home run. And we're just we're just missing the middle section of the Hollywood movies that mm. would come out and would be really, really enjoyable. Uh, even things like the French Connection, would that be a blockbuster? Probably, probably not. Long Day Afternoon, probably not. Uh, those are the kinds of movies that we're just not getting. And there used to be tons of comedy movies. The Producers, Young Frankenstein. We're, and this is going to be a weird thing to say, we're missing Jewish comedy. That's interesting. Elaborate on that. Well, I mean, Woody Allen. Uh, I mean, th think of the movies that were the comedy movies. They were pretty much all Mel Brooks. Uh, Mel Brooks, yeah. Carl uh, Reiner. Carl Reiner, yeah, yeah. I mean, this was all kind of part of the tail end of the Jewish comedic influence mm -hmm. that was then usurped by National Lampoon and Harvard and and The Simpsons. Uh, you know, very kind of white non non-jewish humor mm -hmm. so i want to go ahead no no i i, I, I i'm just saying that that's a very interesting sure. changing of the guard yeah you're on youtube you're doing very well there obviously youtube is not shy about censoring people have you run afoul of the censors at this point and if you do is there a plan b at this point i have not uh primarily because i i probably skirt the edge of you know, my woke commentary. Mm -hmm. I don't tend to swear. Uh, if I do, it is way funnier to come up with an alternative <laughs> phrase. I think swearing generally is lazy. So those are the things that run you afoul. Um, but then again, my channel is about entertainment and YouTube really wants you to uh, hoe that row. They, yeah. they don't want you to divert. I divert because I don't care. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't need the money. I'm doing this because I enjoy myself. I enjoy seeing myself on camera because I'm an e ego, you know, egotist. You can ask my <laughs> wife. Um, but it's it, it's a place for me to um, it's a place for me to avoid the gatekeepers, who for the most part are idiots. I I, I don't think I could handle the five year cycle to get something to air. That's just devastating. Yeah, you're yeah. making nothing for five years, and you're meeting with people, and they're promising you stuff. And I've gone through that already. It's hard. It's really, really hard. So YouTube, in one sense, is a bad thing because I can write, perform, and execute and display my stuff really easily. I, I can take something from my mind and what I call close the circle. And closing the circle is the way you keep yourself sane. Having an open circle that takes five to 10 years to close is what makes you insane. Mm -hmm. So that's the that's the addiction part of YouTube. So uh, you know what? Like I said, uh, you know, it's way more fun coming up with alternatives to swearing. Uh, Woody Allen has this terrific gag where, uh, um, um, uh, you know, he said, uh, I ran into the car in front of me. The driver left his, got out of his car and told me to go forth and multiply, but not <laughs> those words. So isn't that funnier than saying the F word? It sure like is. A hundred times. If, if anyone not, out not, there not, hasn't not, heard the old old school Woody Allen stand up, I, I forget the exact medium I heard it. It was probably a cassette tape back in the day, but oh, yes. it's, it's gold. It's absolute gold. It's fantastic. And I don't think people are using language properly out there because language is funny um you know saying someone is fat is not as funny as some saying someone with uh uh you know extended uh, uh fat storage areas careful you might um, might get canceled for that but <laughs> we're yeah, well then i change the word fat it wouldn't be fat it would be yeah. uh lard like substance storage <laughs> areas <laughs> So, I mean, yeah, you, you take the challenge like you just presented to yeah. me and, and uh, there's a way out of it. And most people don't think of how to write their way out of a cul-de-sac, but that's also what makes things funnier.
Yeah. There's a dry bar comedy platform, which is very successful, and it is squeaky clean to a fault. And that gets a lot of eyeballs. Actually, my mom turned me on to it. My wife did, uh, you know, without either of them knowing about the other doing it. And, uh, and I think they really push that envelope where we can say this, but we can get around it. And that's often funnier than, than what you thought you might say. Paul, I want to wrap up with just picking your sure. brain about the near future. Are there any trends in pop culture that are just bubbling up that are either exciting or disturbing or maybe in between that you're noticing that you don't think has gotten maximum attention as of yet, but probably will? I, I think what we're in the middle of is the kids out there assimilating all this new stuff, uh, the social media, the TikTok, and they're going to come up with the new zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. Not me. I'm not, I'm, it's not going to be me. And it's not going to be, you know, Judd Apatow uh, or, or any of the old guy, or old guard. And, and so I'm not seeing a trend yet. Uh, and I don't know where it's going to come from. But part, part of the problem is what venue is going to exploit it? Because yeah. at one point when back in the days when I was doing sketch in the 70s and the stand-ups, uh, and the 80s and 90s, the, the the goal was to get on a sitcom. So if you don't have a very large pinata out there to try to hit, then there's no ambition. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me what's the big pinata out there? A freaking YouTube channel? <laughs> Is that like, that's pathetic. Yeah, there's a big story about how Trevor Noah is starting a podcast, and they announced it like it was like the, the moon landing part two. I thought every comedian's got a podcast. I mean, good for him, but that hardly seems like That's a the point. Uh, size. You've just change. made the point. That's yeah. exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. So uh -huh. you tell me what's the big pinata that it used to be sitcoms for comedians. Yeah. It's gone. And he used to be getting on Johnny Carson or Jay Leno, too, as the break. Good point. Uh, See, that's exactly my point. I, I would argue maybe an appearance, getting a seat on the Joe Rogan experience might be that, that change agent. But that, okay. again, how few people do that. But I also think that maybe it's just amassing a huge social media following where no matter what you do, you could reach out, you could market, you could publicize your work to whatever you got planned to the, to the audience. That, that's how Louis C.K. bounced back. He's got, a, and, he's got an email list. Yes, and and maybe it's um, kickstartering something. Yeah, look at Ripaverse. <laughs> I know it's amazing. I hope to get him on the. So podcast maybe soon. it's going to be independent self-publishing, but then successful people will be then bought out by some large entertainment corporation. <laughs> yeah, that's so right. you just enjoy it while it lasts. Well, <laughs> I'm waiting. <laughs> that's by right. the way, uh, here's my number five 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 two 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 five 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 five. If you'd like to buy me out, I'm available. That's right. Uh, well, Paul, thank you so much for joining the Hollywood and Total podcast. I'd love to hear more about yet what you have to say, but just go to Paul's invaluable YouTube channel at Call Me Chato. You can get funny, provocative insights you won't hear anywhere else. And you know what? What matters is you've lived the tale. You've been an executive. You are a comedian. You've been in the trenches, and you're smart enough to to roll with the punches and change with the times, which I think a lot of people don't have that ability. You do in spades. Thank you so much, and I love your stuff. Well, thanks, Christian. I very much appreciate you inviting me on your show. Sometimes you need a crazy comedy to make life feel normal. For me, that meant a day where being a parent was just brutal, even harder than usual. I think fellow parents know exactly what I mean. So instead of spending all my time cycling through the recently added section at Amazon Prime and Netflix, which I do way too much, I just went for it. Said, hey, there's a movie, Bad Teacher. I've seen it. I liked it. Had some good memories. I'll watch it again. Cameron Diaz plays a gold-digging beauty who's ready to kiss her teaching gig goodbye. She's got her man. He's got bucks. And she's going to suck up every last one of them, that's for sure. She is set. Except the fiancé and his mom realize what she's up to, and he dumps her. Now she's forced to go back to teaching those snot-nosed kids. That's her take on it, not mine. She's a, wait for it, bad teacher. But she'll do her time because she wants to raise enough money to get a boob job so she can get another super-rich boyfriend. 
I mentioned boobs twice in one episode. <laughs> Life gets in the way, of course, and this is a redemption story, ultimately. It actually reminded me a little bit of Bad Santa, and that's a compliment. Two good movies here. Now, Diaz sells every part of the story. She's beautiful, obviously, but she's a really good comic actress, and I'm a little sad that she's semi-retired at this point. Now, the one thing that Bad, bad Teacher lacks is a gut-busting moment. You know, one of those scenes where you think, oh my gosh, I can't believe how funny it was. I'm going to tell all my friends about it. There's nothing like that here, but the laughs are frequent and they land. That matters. There's also nothing uber-woke or feminist about the film. There's no big moral lessons. It's just good, and it chased my parenting blues away for just one night, and that was precious. Bad Teacher is available right now on Amazon Prime. It's good enough for any kind of distraction. Well, that's it for the show. Thank you to Radio America for having me as a part of their fine podcast lineup. And while I have your ear, I hope you'll drop by HollywoodInToto.com. It's updated seven days a week and has all the stories that Variety and The Hollywood Reporter won't cover. And that's a lot. See you next time. 